Hi, I'm Rod Saffin, and in this tutorial, I'll be discussing the anatomy of the human head while trying to keep it relevant to the digital artist and not getting too in-depth with technical and medical terms. First of all, we're just going to look at the general proportions of the average head. The eyes are generally placed halfway down the head, although this obviously varies a lot. Children's eyes are a lot lower. Um, and in adult males, it's quite common for the eyes to be a lot higher. A larger proportion of the head being the facial mass with a smaller cranial mass at the top. In fact, this can be as much as two thirds face to one third cranium. If we draw a line along the top of the brow ridge and one under the chin, the bottom of the nose is generally placed halfway along this line. And the mouth one third of the way from the nose to the chin. The corners of the mouth generally lining up with the centre of the eyes. One more point to note is that the width of the nose at its widest point is generally the same as one eye. Looking at the side view, the main point to be aware of here is giving the skull its full mass. A mistake people tend to make is making the skull mass too small for the face. The distance from the chin to the top of the skull should be the same as from the brow ridge to the back of the skull. These two lines should be equal. If you imagine two egg shapes, one for the face and one for the cranial mass, these two egg shapes should be roughly equal in proportion. Finding the ear from this side view is very easy. We just draw the line from the brow ridge to the back of the skull and again, halfway across this line is the ears slanting back at about a 12 degree angle. Um, and for the height of the ear, you just take the top of the brow and the bottom of the nose. One extra proportional guide that I find very useful is this X drawn on the side of the face. The first line is basically following the contour of the eye socket around, coming down onto the cheekbone, again in the side view, following the contour of the eye socket, and then coming on down and marking off the mass of the master muscle here. This second line is more of a virtual marker. It's basically marking off the frontal plane of the face here, from the side plane of the face. So you've got the frontal plane. And the side plane here. Uh, this line, of course, doesn't actually exist. You can see it's intersected by other planes and masses of the face here. But it's something you want to be aware of. It becomes more important when you render heads, especially with reflection. Reflection strongly delineates the planes of the face. So it's very important to keep in mind that this line is here, even if you can't see it. Now we'll get into the actual details of the facial features. This is really all about learning to visualize the construction, uh, the planes and masses, proportions of the standard head model. From there, you, you'll be able to quickly appraise individual heads in the real world uh, and work out how they differ from this standard model. Well, for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm basically going to concentrate on one facial feature at a time and take it right through to completion which is not the way I normally work. Um, I usually just bring the whole head up from low resolution to high resolution at the same time. But it's going to be a lot more useful for the purposes of this tutorial just to concentrate on one feature at a time. I will start off here with the nose. Uh, the nose, like most facial features, can be broken down into several sections. The upper part of the bridge is bone, and where the bone ends you get a ridge. Um, this is usually the widest part of the nose from the front view as well. Bone then gives way to the lateral cartilages, which is actually two mirrored pieces of cartilage. And where they meet in the middle, you can often see a very definite groove. The wings of the nose are not made of cartilage. They're actually just dense fibrous tissue, which is why this part of the nose is so flexible. The septal cartilage which connects the two nostrils together, usually favours one side or the other. 
which is why the nostrils are virtually never identical. The actual process of sculpting is pretty similar for all the features of the face. Um, it basically starts off just by cutting in lines around the features, then using the pinch tool, which just helps to shape the topology and the polyflow of the model to the forms and masses that you want, and then just relaxing that a little with a smooth tool. One of the important features of the mouth is the modalis, which is the little mound here at the corners of the mouth. It basically acts as a hub to which a lot of other muscles surrounding the mouth and coming down off the cheekbone connect into. It's a free-floating hub of fibrous tissue, and this in large part is what gives the mouth such a great degree of mobility. One important aspect of the medialis is that it's often very visible from the three-quarter view. And you can see that the fatty mass of the infraorbital triangle which comes down off the nose, always wraps around the outside of this medialis. Just on the inside of the medialis you can see a very definite dimple right at the corner of the mouth, and the juxtaposition of this dimple right next to the raised mound beside it is a very important feature to render correctly. These two forms, the infraorbital triangle and the medialis, form a crease down the middle called the nasolabial furrow. This is very visible from both the front and side views. Another important feature of topology at the bottom of the mouth are the pillars, which are usually visible as two bags exiting out of the hollow under the bottom lip and wrapping round towards the medialis. Another important thing to remember about the mouth is the curvature when looking at it from a bottom or top view, due to the fact that the mouth is sitting on a large curved mound formed by the two dental arches of the teeth. The upper lip forms a shallow M shape, at the centre of which juts forward like the brow of a ship. Normally the upper lip protrudes further out than the bottom lip, although in certain individuals with overbites, the, the bottom lip actually juts out further. Very little of the skill and knowledge required to, to sculpt a human body is about the technical knowledge of how to do the actual sculpting, about which brushes to use and and how to use them. I mean, 99% of the knowledge required is all about anatomy, knowledge of the actual subject matter that you're trying to model.